There used to be a basic bargain in industrial countries for the last 100 years or so. If you contributed to the success and profitability of the enterprise with which you worked, with which you worked, you got to share in the profitability. You got to share in the benefits. That bargain has been broken through no fault of any single enterprise or any segment of society, but it has been broken. There's a gap the last four decades is growing between productivity and wages. That's real. Result, at least in my country and some of yours, in stagnation. And the reason I talk so much about the middle class is I firmly believe that a thriving and growing middle class has been the main reason for economic stability, political stability, and social stability in our democracies. It is the fiber that holds us together. Capitalism is failing. What started as a crisis of the finance system has spilled over into social upheavals, civil wars, as in Syria and Ukraine, and upset the geopolitical balance. If we don't find an alternative to the neoliberal model of capitalism, whose crisis is at the center of all these developments, the world will be in chaos by 2050. I don't want to scare you, but there is a rational case for panic. The OECD is among many forecasters predicting suppressed growth for the next 50 years. Inequality levels, they say, will rocket. And other economists worry about the impetus from higher education levels and the development of the global south being just a one-off. And if you add to this the demographic ageing problem, which Standard & Poor's says will make 60% of all country debts junk, and then climate change, what you're going to need is an economic system that works. But neoliberalism is broken. If you suppress wages, destroy the bargaining power of the workforce, and then expand the money supply without end, you create a cycle of booms and busts. And every bust wipes out a bit of the welfare state, and no bust ever properly wipes out the debts. So neoliberalism has become a machine for creating austerity. But I think there's an escape route. It's not about suppressing the market or deglobalizing the world. It's about understanding the potential of the technological revolution we're living through. First, the amount of work we need to do is falling. But if we automated things properly, not just production, but services, we could massively reduce the hours of work we need to do and consign the coercive bullshit that takes place at the precarious end of the labor market to history. Second, information is corroding the price system. The true market value of anything you can copy and paste is close to zero. The solution has been giant technology firms dedicated to monopolizing information, but these can't last and they're not functional in an information society. Third, because information is inherently social, you're getting the spontaneous rise of non-market collaborative ventures. Wikipedia is the best known, open source software is a good example, but it goes way beyond that. The non-market survival mechanisms, the co-ops, time banks, informal sharing that goes on between, say, artists or software developers, that's what I'm talking about. And all right, this seems like a very fragile and uncertain thing on which to base a new system, but so did banking in the age of kings who could behead bankers. Basically, things can change. Post-capitalism is the system that will emerge if we suppress monopolies and let prices of information and things fall, and if we radically delink work from wages, and if we then nurture that part of the economy where free, shared, and socially produced things are replacing money and market forces. Is post-capitalism impossible? I don't think so. I think what's impossible is the democracy of riot squads, oligarch-run political parties, fiscal coercion by central banks, the surveillance state. That's what's impossible. We're in a world where technology means we can first imagine things and then go out and make them. And all I'm asking is, why can't we do that with a new kind of economy as well?
and the robots say, um, we like to work for you. We don't hate work, we like to work, and please let us work. And the basic income enables everyone to take part in that huge advantage we have today, that technology and robots and all that uh, can take over the hard work we used to do uh, 100 years ago and still are doing. So the main message is, we like to work for you. And the fourth industrial revolution, the main topic at the uh, World Economic Forum, this is not a problem. It's a huge advantage and it's a great uh, prosperity um, society that will come. So as long as we put together income and work and don't detach them, we have a huge problem. And that's what is discussed here at World Economic Forum. And our solution is, let's detach work and income on an existential minimum. And that it's, uh, it's a very interesting idea, it has a long history. And right now, in, in many places of the world, people are discussing about this idea to introduce an unconditional basic income. And especially in Switzerland, we're going through a threshold now, this summer, where the public, uh, every Swiss citizen is going to vote on the question, do you want to introduce a basic income for everybody or not? Robots can, first of all, have access to vast amounts of data. So as they're moving through an environment, they could access data on demand from things that they're encountering, figuring out what they need to download. Remember in the Matrix, there you could, you could download a, uh, a, you know, the, the program of how to put something together or how to interact with something. I know Kung Fu. Now robots are sharing information. So when one robot discovers a better way to pick up a glass, it's instantly shared with all the other robots. This idea of the collective learning is enormously exciting and that's changing the field and, and for example that's what Google is doing in the robotic car and the advantage that Google has over the auto companies is that they understand the network so that car is constantly getting downloading maps and images and traffic and weather conditions and then sharing it with all the other robots procedures will be able to be performed by the robot autonomously it's like autopilot autopilots are better than human pilots and landing in let's say foggy conditions Right? So there's some things that we will trust them with. It's a very real fear. I, I, and I think the, the one thing we certainly do have to worry about is jobs. I think this is an enormous issue, that uh, technology is changing jobs and, and, and removing them in the short term will be a lot of disruption. What we should start thinking about is the multiplicity. And the multiplicity is actually a very positive idea. It's where you have groups of people of humans working together with groups of machines. We're already seeing it to some degree. If you think about how a Google search engine works, it's, a, it, it's taking input from many, many humans at the same time as many, many machines. And they're all integrated together to give you extremely good search results. All the commercial activity, in particular Google, buying the robot companies, Amazon's very interested. And, and the, there's really a, a real sense of the excitement that we're at an inflection point for robotics.